at the beginning of the 5th century BC, the ancient world was dominated by the Achaemenid Empire, commonly referred to as the First Persian Empire. It was the largest empire the world had ever known, extending from the Balkan Peninsula in the west to the Indus Valley in the east, with a multitude of different peoples and cultures living under its rule. The empire had five principal cities, each of which had served as a capital at different periods in its history. Persepolis acted as a ceremonial capital. The man who ruled over this vast empire was Darius I, otherwise known as Darius the Great, King of Kings. In order to govern such a diverse territory, the Persians divided the land into administrative provinces called satrapies that were governed by satraps, local rulers who governed in the name of the king, administrating affairs, collecting taxes, and acting as the supreme judge of their province. Along the western boundary of the empire lay the region of Ionia, within which were located a number of Greek cities. The Persians had long struggled to control the independent-minded Greeks, and had appointed local Greek rulers named tyrants to govern the major cities. Tyranny in ancient Greece was a form of governance by which a ruler gained power through unconventional means, often by force as opposed to the constitutional authority of a king or an elected leader. Dissatisfaction amongst the Greek cities of Ionia and the rest of Asia Minor with the tyrants imposed on them by their Persian overlords ran high. The region was ripe for rebellion. All that was needed was a spark to light the touch paper of revolt. That spark came in the spring of 499 BC, when Aristagoras, the tyrant of the Greek city of Miletus, launched an expedition with Persian support to conquer the island of Naxos. The enterprise was a debacle, and to preempt his inevitable dismissal by the Persians, Aristagoras abdicated and declared Miletus a democracy. Other Ionian cities followed suit, and soon the Persians were faced with a full-scale rebellion of the Greek cities of Asia Minor. This was the beginning of a series of conflicts between the Persian Empire and the Greek city-states over the following 50 years that would go on to be known as the Greco-Persian Wars. Aristagoras looked across the Aegean Sea to recruit allies amongst fellow Greeks for the rebellion against the Persians. He first sailed to Sparta, the preeminent Greek military power of the time, but found his requests for support rejected by the Spartan king Cleomenes. Undeterred, Aristagoras travelled to Athens, where his petitions found a more sympathetic ear from the Athenians, who were already enemies of the Persians. He also managed to gain the support of the mercantile city of Eritrea. With military and financial support from the Athenians and Eritreans, the rebellion lasted for six years until finally, in 493 BC, the last of the Greek resistance in Asia Minor was crushed and the pacified region was brought back under Persian control. The Persian king, Darius the Great, vowed to punish Athens and Eritrea for their support of the revolt and soon determined to conquer the whole of Greece, thus expanding his empire into Europe and crushing the troublesome Greek states once and for all. In 492 BC, a Persian expeditionary force consisting of a fleet and a land army was assembled under the command of Mardonius, the son-in-law of Darius. Setting off from Cilicia, on the south coast of Asia Minor, the army began their long march northwestward, whilst the navy sailed around the coast of Asia Minor to rendezvous with the army of the Hellespont, the gateway to Europe. This marked the beginning of the First Greco-Persian War. After being transported across the strait by the navy, the army headed westward into Thrace, whilst the navy mirrored their progress along the coast. Following the successful resubjugation of the Thracians and the conquest of Macedonia, the Persian forces decided to return back to the Hellespont after Mardonius was wounded in the fighting and a ferocious storm sunk many of the Persian ships. Despite these setbacks, a clear message had been sent to the Greeks of Darius's intentions and his capacity to realise them. The following year, the Persian king sent his ambassadors to the Greek states, asking for earth and water, a traditional token of submission. Fearful of the wrath of Darius, most of the Greek states agreed to his terms. Crucially, however, Athens and Sparta, 
the two most powerful forces in Greece did not submit. In Athens, the Persian ambassadors were put on trial and executed. In Sparta, the ambassadors were not even afforded the privilege of a trial, and were simply thrown down a well. The battle lines had been firmly drawn as the Athenians and Spartans stood together to resist the Persian invader. Enraged by the blatant disregard shown by the Greeks for the accepted international convention that guaranteed safe passage for ambassadors, Darius ordered his forces to crush the Greek cities that had not submitted to his rule. In 490 BC, the Persian navy once again set sail from Cilicia, this time carrying an invasion force that would strike directly at the Greek city-states. In charge of the Persian forces were the Median admiral Datis and the Persian general Artophanes, who was also the nephew of the king Darius. The fleet rounded the coast of Asia Minor and then headed out across the Aegean, attacking Greek islands as they went. The islanders of Naxos were punished for their resistance to the attempted Persian invasion a decade earlier that had been the catalyst for the Ionian revolt. The city and temples of the island were burnt to the ground and the population of the island enslaved. Finally, the Persian fleet reached the Greek mainland and the Persian army besieged the city of Eritrea. After six days of fighting, the Eritreans were betrayed by two of their own citizens who opened the gates of the city to the Persians. Once inside the city walls, the Persians administered the same revenge on the Eritreans as they had dealt to the unfortunate islanders of Naxos. The city was looted, the temples burned, statues destroyed, and the inhabitants enslaved. With the fall of Eritrea, the Persians turned their attention to the other great supporter of the Ionian revolt, Athens. The task force headed south and landed at the Bay of Marathon, just 25 miles from Athens. As panic swept the city, the Athenian army marched north to engage with the invaders, and the two armies met on the plain of Marathon. In support of the Athenians, the city-state of Plataea sent a force of 1,000 hoplites to join the 10,000 Athenian troops. Together the allied numbers were still far fewer than the 26,000 Persian troops that they faced. Heavily outnumbered, the Athenian generals sent an Athenian messenger runner named Phidippides to Sparta requesting support. However, the Spartans were in the middle of the religious festival of Carnea. There was a sacrosanct period of peace in Spartan culture. The Spartans gave assurances that reinforcements would come, but that the Spartan forces would not be able to march to war until the rising of the full moon. The Athenians would have to wait for at least 10 days for the Spartans to arrive. After five days of stalemate, during which the Persian and Athenian armies observed each other across the Marathon Plain, it was the Athenian generals who finally gave the order to advance against the enemy. In spite of the clear Persian numerical supremacy, the Athenian hoplites managed to gain the upper hand in the battle, and the Persians fled the battlefield for the safety of their ships. The Persians had failed in their primary objective to crush the Greek city-states who had supported the Ionian revolt. However, they had still managed to expand their influence in the Balkan Peninsula. Thrace remained under Persian control, and Macedonia was reduced to a subordinate kingdom of the Persian Empire. Greece was saved for now. However, Darius did not abandon his ambition to one day invade the whole of Greece and punish the Greek states that had defied him. When Darius died in 486 BC, his son Xerxes I took control of the Persian preparations for the invasion of Greece. Five years later, as the Persian preparations neared their completion, Xerxes, like his father before him, sent out ambassadors to the Greek city-states, asking for earth and water in a display of submission to the Persian Empire. This time, however, no ambassadors were sent to the Athenians or Spartans. As a result, the resistance to the Persian invasion naturally began to coalesce around the two great city-states. Finally, in 480 BC, ten years after the defeat at Marathon, Xerxes led his army across the Hellespont into Europe to fulfil his father's ambition to bring the entirety of Greece under Persian control. So began what was to become known as the Second Greco-Persian War. The Persian army was comprised of troops of various ethnicities from all corners of the empire, as illustrated on a relief carved into the side of the tomb of Xerxes. According to ancient Greek sources, the size of the Persian army numbered anywhere between 800,000 and 4 million men. 
Contemporary estimates, however, are more conservative, putting the true figure closer to somewhere between 200,000 and 500,000 men. What is clear is that Xerxes crossed into Europe with a force overwhelmingly superior in numbers to the defending Greeks. In order to allow the transport of such an enormous number of men across the Hellespont, the Persian engineers had constructed two enormous pontoons made up of anchored ships that had been bound together with flax and papyrus cables. The Persian forces moved west through Thrace and Macedonia before turning south to enter mainland Greece. They were supported by the Persian navy who matched their progress just off the Greek coast. The Greeks met at the Allied Congress to discuss plans for the defence of Greece. News that Xerxes had crossed the Hellespont and of the enormous size of the Persian army forced the Greeks to abandon their original plan to confront the Persian invaders at the Vale of Tempe in Thessaly. The Athenian general Themistocles proposed a new plan to stop the Persian advance by blocking the narrow pass at Thermopylae while simultaneously using the Allied navy to protect the army's right flank by blocking the Straits of Artemisium. At this time, the Spartans were celebrating the festival of Carnea, the same festival that had prevented them sending reinforcements in time to participate in the Battle of Marathon. This coupled with the fact that the Olympic Games were underway and the Olympic truce was in effect, made the act of marching to war doubly sacrilegious for the Spartans. Despite this, the Ephors, the Spartan ruling council, agreed that the urgency was such that it would be permissible to send an advance force. Leonidas, the king of Sparta, set off to battle with 300 men of his personal bodyguard. According to the Greek historian Herodotus, Leonidas had become convinced that he and his men were marching to their deaths, and so selected as his companions only Spartan warriors who had already sired male heirs and would be able to continue their bloodline. The Spartan force marched northward and were joined by soldiers from allied city-states along their journey. In total, the Greek forces at Thermopylae numbered roughly 7,000 troops, a total vastly outnumbered by the Persian forces. The Persian army arriving at Thermopylae found the pass blocked by the Greek hoplites. Whilst a few miles out to sea, the Persian fleet spotted the Athenian-dominated Greek navy in the Straits of Artemisium, protecting the flank of the land forces. In response, the Persian army set up camp in the approaches to the past, whilst the Persian fleet was divided in two, the first contingent to engage the Greek fleet, whilst the second contingent sailed down the eastern coast of Euvea to block any retreat of the Greek fleet. A few days later, disaster struck the second fleet, as they were caught in a ferocious storm off the coast, and the majority of the Persian ships were shipwrecked. As Themistocles had planned, the narrow pass at Thermopylae neutralised the Persians' numerical supremacy, and the Greek hoplites, led by the Spartans, managed to fight off wave after wave of Persian attacks for two days. On the second day, however, good fortune favoured the Persians, when a local Greek man named Ephialtes entered the Persian camp, offering to betray the Greek forces in the hope of a reward from the Persian king. Ephialtes informed Xerxes that there was a little-known mountain path that would allow the Persians to outflank the Greeks, and offered to guide the Persian army himself. The next day, the Greeks were shocked to find the force of Persians behind their position. Realising the situation was now hopeless, Leonidas and his Spartan troops, along with contingents of Thebans and Thespians, decided to make a last stand to allow the rest of the Greek forces to escape. The Greek rearguard moved into the open ground beyond the pass to confront the Persians head-on, but despite heroic fighting, were overwhelmed by the Persian forces. As their numbers decreased, the Greeks became easy targets for the Persian archers, and many were felled by the Persian arrows, including the Spartan king, Leonidas. On hearing the news of Leonidas' death, the Greek navy command realised that their objective of protecting the army's flank was no longer valid, and they decided to disengage from fighting the Persians, and to retreat back to the island of Salamis, just offshore from Athens. Victory at Thermopylae opened the road to central Greece for the Persian forces, and they immediately moved south, conquering the Greek states in their path as they went. In September of 480 BC, the Persians reached the gates of Athens. Deciding not to defend the city, the Greek alliance instead ordered the evacuation of the entire population with the aid of the Greek naval fleet to the island of Salamis. The Persians entered the city, 
and quickly overcame the resistance put up by the small number of Athenians who had barricaded themselves on the Acropolis, the ancient city citadel. Xerxes ordered the city to be torched and for the Acropolis to be razed. The Persian forces plundered the city, profaning temples and destroying the Greeks' most sacred monuments, including the old temple of Athena and the older Parthenon. The Greek land forces had retreated to the Isthmus of Corinth, where they set up a defensive position, building a fortified wall in order to prevent a Persian invasion of the Peloponnese Peninsula. With the evacuation of Athens complete, the Greek command met in a council of war to decide the best strategy for the navy. The Corinthian naval commander, Adimantus, was in favour of implementing a blockade of the Saronic Gulf in order to prevent the Persians using their navy to outflank the Greek defences on the Isthmus of Corinth. Themistocles, however, favoured an offensive strategy whereby the Greek fleet would engage the Persian fleet in battle in the Straits of Salamis. He argued that the recent naval battle in the Straits of Artemisium had shown that fighting in close quarters worked in the favour of the smaller Greek fleet. In the end, Themistocles' argument won the day and the Greek fleet prepared for battle. In a clever subterfuge, Themistocles sent one of his servants to the camp of Xerxes with news that the Greek general was secretly on the king's side and that the allied command was riven with infighting. The servant also disclosed that the Peloponnesians were planning to evacuate that very night and that to gain victory all the Persians needed to do was to block the straits. Eager to achieve a knockout blow against the Greek navy, Xerxes and Mardonius both took the bait overriding the concerns expressed by some of the more cautious Persian commanders. As the Greeks had hoped, the Persian fleet entered the Straits in an attempt to trap the Greek fleet. Once again, Themistocles' strategy proved to be effective, as in the cramped conditions of the Straits, the huge Persian numerical advantage was neutralised. The Persian ships quickly became disorganised and struggled to manoeuvre in such close quarters. Seizing their chance, the Greek ships formed in line and achieved a decisive victory over the Persian fleet. With the Greeks now ascendant on the sea, Xerxes feared that the Greek navy would destroy the pontoons his troops had used to cross the Hellespont, and in doing so trap his army in Europe. He therefore ordered the majority of the army to retreat back to Asia, leaving behind the force of elite troops under the command of Mardonius, with instructions to continue in the prosecution of the war. Whilst Xerxes marched home with the bulk of the army, Mardonius withdrew from Athens and overwintered his troops in Thessaly. Herodotus estimated that the number of troops in Mardonius's army was 300,000 men. Although this figure is widely disputed, it is agreed that a significant Persian force remained in Greece to continue the invasion campaign. Over the winter, Mardonius pursued a diplomatic approach with the Athenians, he knew that a peace agreement with Athens would deprive the Greeks of the bulk of their fleet, thus removing a major obstacle to the conquest of the Peloponnese Peninsula. Acting as the intermediary for the Persians was Alexander I of Macedon, one of Alexander the Great's ancestors. The terms Alexander offered to the Athenians on the Persians' behalf were peace, continued self-governance and territorial expansion if they submitted to the Persian king. The Athenians publicly rejected the offer, making sure that the Spartan ambassadors to Athens were present at the time. On receiving the news of the rejection, Mardonius marched his troops south and in the spring of 479 BC, the Athenians were once again forced to abandon their city. To punish the Athenians for their refusal to submit to Xerxes, Mardonius ordered that the city be razed to the ground. The Persian sacking of Athens and Eritrea would be seared into the Greek conscious for generations to come. Over a century later, the memory of the events would be used as a rallying cry by Philip II of Macedon, Alexander the Great's father, in his attempt to persuade the leaders of the Greek states to join a pan-Hellenic force to invade Asia Minor and to finally achieve revenge against the Persians. Excavations in the 19th century unearthed remains of some of the statues that had adorned the Acropolis at the time and were targeted by the Persians. The damaged statues bear witness to the destruction wrought by the Persians. Despite the very public Athenian rejection of the Persian overtures to strike a bilateral peace agreement, 
the Spartans and allies were not willing to move from their defensive positions in order to aid the Athenians. The Athenians felt abandoned by their allies and refused to allow their navy to join up with the rest of the Greek navy at Delos. In desperation, the Athenians sent messages to the Spartans that contained veiled threats that a continued lack of support would force them to look more favourably on future diplomatic efforts by the Persians. Recognising the danger to the whole of Greece if Athens were to agree a peace deal with the Persians, the Spartans reluctantly agreed to abandon their defensive strategy and to go on the offensive in order to aid the Athenians. In the summer of 479 BC, the Spartans and their Peloponnesian allies, under the command of the Spartan general Pausanias, marched north across the Isthmus of Corinth. Once again the Spartan-led force was joined by allies on their march north, including some 8,000 hoplites from Athens. In response to the Spartan land offensive, the Athenians ordered their sizable navy to join the rest of the Greek fleet at the island of Delos. After the bruising defeat at Salamis, what was left of the Persian fleet had sailed to the island of Samos on the Ionian coast. The Greek fleet at Delos was approached by a delegation from Samos, who suggested that the Ionian cities would revolt if the Allied fleet could defeat the Persian fleet moored at Samos. Buoyed by the prospect of inciting the Ionians into rebellion, as well as news received about the poor morale of the Persian fleet, Leotychidas, the Spartan commander of the combined Greek fleet, decided to set sail for Samos. With both the Greek army and navy on the move, the outcome of the war hung in the balance, but would soon be decided once and for all. On receiving the news that the Greeks were marching north, Mardonius retreated with his Persian troops and his Greek allies to the city of Plataea, where he made camp and waited for the Greek army. When the two armies finally met, they spent 11 days facing each other across the battlefield, occasionally carrying out harrying raids, but without committing their forces, with neither side wanting to make a misstep. The stalemate was finally broken when one of the Persian cavalry raids managed to foul and block the Gargathia spring, which was a Greek's main source of water. The Greeks were forced to retreat in order to reorganise their supply lines and gain access to a new source of water. This tactical move was misinterpreted by the Persians as a full-scale Greek retreat, and Mardonius ordered his troops to pursue the Greeks. To the Persians' surprise, the Greeks did not break ranks and attempt to flee, instead forming into position in order to meet the Persians head-on. In the confusion of the battle, a Spartan warrior managed to fight his way through the ring of protection around Mardonius and to slay the Persian general. The loss of their inspirational leader had a devastating impact on the Persian troops and precipitated a rout of the Persian forces. Retreating to their fortified camp, the Persians were besieged by the Greeks and slaughtered. To commemorate the battle, a bronze column in the shape of intertwined snakes was created from melted down Persian weapons acquired in the plunder of the Persian camp and erected at Delphi. The remains of the column are now located in the Sultan Ahmet Square in Istanbul. Across the Aegean Sea, the Greek fleet was nearing the coast of Samos. On sighting the approaching Greek navy, the majority of the Persian ships sailed to the Ionian mainland, whilst the Phoenician contingent of the fleet was ordered to sail for home. Keen to avoid a further naval confrontation with the Greeks, the Persians decided to beach their ships below the slopes of Mount Mycale. With the support of a Persian army group stationed nearby, they built a fortified camp and awaited the Greek advance. Seeing that the Persians had beached their ships and made camp, Leotychidas sailed as close to the shore as his ships would allow, and called out to the Ionian Greeks who were part of the Persian army, imploring them to desert their Persian overlords and fight as free men. As well as hoping to persuade the Ionians to switch allegiances, Leotychidas also hoped to sow mistrust amongst the Persians of the Ionian troops that served amongst them. According to Herodotus, the Greeks received news of the Greek victory at Plataea as they were making their preparations to attack the Persians. This greatly emboldened the Greeks as they launched their attack on the Persian camp, sending forward their marines into battle. On the left flank of the Greek force were the Spartans, whilst the right flank was made up of a combined force dominated by the Athenians. On seeing the relatively small size of the Greek force, the Persians moved forward away from the protection of their camp 
in order to meet the Greeks in battle. Despite a valiant defence from the Persian soldiers, once again they proved no match for the Greek hoplites. The Greeks drove the Persians back to their fortified camp and eventually broke through the final defences, aided by the Ionian troops who had indeed switched allegiances as the Persians had feared. At the conclusion of the battle, the Persian ships were captured and burned, marking the end of the Persian naval threat. The twin Greek victories at Plataea and Mycale effectively put an end to the Persians' dream of invading Greece. In contrast to the aftermath of the first Persian invasion ten years before, the Greek forces were now strong enough to go on the offensive, and over the next 30 years succeeded in pushing the Persians completely out of Europe. From this moment, the limit of the Persian Empire was set along the Aegean shores of Asia Minor. The success of the Pan-Hellenic forces over the Persian invasion forces soon passed into Greek folklore and will act as a powerful rallying cry for many decades to come. The Greek soldiers have proved themselves to be superior to their Persian counterparts, erasing forever the myth of Persian invincibility. Just as important in the collective Greek imagination would be the memory of the Persian destruction of Athens and Eritrea that created a burning desire to someday exact revenge on the hated Persians. With the threat of a Persian invasion receding in their memories, the Greeks returned to an uneasy peace amongst themselves. The subsequent decades would see a flourishing of Greek society, especially in the great democratic city of Athens, where a new Parthenon would be built. It is this period that would become to be known as the Greek classical period, producing a profusion of art and philosophy that would go on to shape Western culture and thought up to the present day. If you have enjoyed this production, please consider supporting the channel by leaving a like and or subscribing to the channel.